Okay, we're there with you. All right, now, as we said before, from last, you can tell you about this tape, we're going to play. And we know so all of you have your tape on cut now, so we're going to present to you the new world order, involvement of the CIA in people business. <laughs> an organization which acts above the law, an organization that acts without conscience, without morals, without regret. A group who follow only a dark and untouchable ideology. Black helicopters and black ops are real. An organization above the law, without a god and without a conscience, do exist. There is no price too high and no casualties too great. A cold, rogue organization that has risen up independent of the people, independent of government. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. It was not until 1941 when motivated by Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor that the USA decided that it was time they became part of what was known as the Great Game. When the US entered World War II, they were lacking in vital spy and counter-spy skills. The Russians, British and Germans had been mastering these skills for centuries. The USA was at an obvious disadvantage. The wheels were set in motion and in 1942 the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, was created. General William Donovan, a World War I hero, was selected to head the organization. His determined, jovial personality and his upper-class status set the tone and played a significant role in shaping the actions and attitudes, actions that would later be inherited by the OSS successor. The OSS not only carried out the daily operations of intelligence gathering, but in addition, it was engaged as a concealed weapon for the various resistance and partisan organizations fighting in occupied countries in both Europe and the Far East. The hierarchy of the organization were students of Harvard, Yale and other Ivy League colleges, sons of the upper class who could combine exquisite taste, impeccable manners and brutal ruthlessness. The OSS had developed several assassination attempts against Adolf Hitler. They almost succeeded in their attempts when a bomb plot in 1944 came close to blowing him up at his wolf's lair. As Germany collapsed, a race against the Russians for Nazi technology and intelligence begun. The OSS, under the codename Operation Paperclip, obtained a number of files and records detailing experiments involving mind control and psychoactive drugs that were conducted on the concentration camp inmates. They also obtained key surviving Nazi personnel such as Joseph Mengel, the doctor in charge of human experiments. Mengel and other war criminals were quietly relocated to Canada. General Reinhard Gellin was the head of Hitler's intelligence. When Germany's defeat was imminent, Gellin predicted that the future conflict would be waged between the two emerging superpowers, America and the Soviet Union. Gellin, as part of a deal with the American military, agreed to surrender important documents pertaining to the Soviet Union. In addition, as part of that deal, he asked that his organization, the Gellin Organization, be absorbed into U.S. military intelligence. In 1947, the U.S. Congress passed an act that absorbed the OSS into a new organization called the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA was born. The newly found agency had the responsibility of coordinating, evaluating and disseminating information from other US intelligent organizations. However, written in the fine print of this act was the additional duty of fighting the dark and eminent Cold War against communism. In 1953, the CIA began its full-out war against communism. The red threat was equated to Satanism. This threat was declared the enemy of the free world. Such a danger was to be unrelentlessly fought tooth and nail. Every tool in their arsenal was to be used to crush any communist rhetoric. 
if our most privileged information about the world has been coming to us, to our policymakers, since 1948 through the CIA, then the worldview that the CIA has presented in the Oval Office is a worldview that basically is founded in a Nazi intelligence organization, the Galen Organization, which has been there from the beginning, and what we have today is simply the heirs of that original choice. The policy adapted by the agency was that once you were against communism, nothing else mattered. They therefore had no scruples about hiring the most powerful organized crime families to do their dirty work. The question was asked, how long could a supposedly democratically sanctioned organization go on doing business with thugs, madmen and gangsters without starting to resemble them? The first victim in the CIA's path of destruction was to be Guatemala. In 1952, Guatemalan President Jacob Arbenz signed a land reform law that would ultimately take into state ownership the large number of plantations owned by U.S. fruit companies. Alan Dulles felt that Arbenz might be an inspiration to other countries in Central America. This would undoubtedly lead to a destabilization of U.S. economic interests in these countries. Arbenz had to go. Using leaflets, planted articles, comic books and news stories, the agency spread the alarmist impression that Guatemala was going to become communist at any moment. Rumors were spread of R. Benz's supposed plan to replace the regular army with armed militia and make himself the absolute dictator of the country. The radio station La Voz de Liberación, controlled by the CIA, began broadcasting out of Honduras the false impression that thousands of anti-communist freedom fighters were massing on the border, ready to invade. R. Benz, however, never had more than 400 men under his control at any point in time during the revolution. He was now losing the support of his army and air force. On June the 2nd, 1954, a failed attempt was made on Arbenz's life. Two weeks later, CIA plans went into action, bombing and strafing the major cities, including the capital, Guatemala City. It was at this point that Arbenz, who had previously stood strong, could no longer stand the pressure. And after persuasion from trusted senior officers, Arbenz handed in his resignation. Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas leader of the anti-Arbenz Liberation Army, moved in and with the support of the agency took political control. Armas subsequently reversed most of Arbenz's reforms and offered great concessions to foreign investors. It is clear that this nation, in concert with all the free nations of this hemisphere, must take an ever closer and more realistic look at the menace of external communist intervention and domination. Next on the CIA's list was Cuba. The attempt to destabilize this country would prove to be the CIA's worst nightmare. Cuba, under the leadership of General Batista, thrived on corruption and bribery. In January 1960, the overthrow of Batista by Fidel Castro and his revolutionary army would mark the turning point for Cuba. December of 19... 59, Castro does a major policy speech in Havana, announces he's a communist. Now he's upset not just the American mafia, but now the American government. A communist country a few hundred miles off the shores of the USA was seen as the ultimate threat. In the interest of American banks and sugar industry, Castro too had to go. However, they underestimated the strength of Cuba. The Cuban army was well prepared to defend their independence with their lives if necessary. The agency soon realized that the removal of Castro would prove more difficult than they initially thought. It is clear that the forces of communism are not to be underestimated in Cuba or anywhere else in the world. The advantages of a police state, its use of mass terror and arrest to prevent the spread of free dissent cannot be overlooked if the self-discipline of the free cannot match the iron discipline of the male fist, then the peril of freedom will continue to rise. It was then that plans were put into place for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Under the guidance of Covert Operations Director Richard Bissell, 1,500 men backed by full U.S. naval and air support were to make a D-Day-style landing on the beach of Paya Giron on the Bay of Pigs. They were then to join forces with what was believed to be a large anti-Castro underground coalition, recruited by the likes of George Bush, 
a top CIA official at that time. At the end of 1960, these plans were given the stamp of approval by President John Kennedy. However, after consulting with his brother Bobby Kennedy and other civilian advisers, several flaws were discovered. It was then that Kennedy withdrew his decision and firmly ruled out any direct U.S. troop involvement or large-scale American air support. This order was ignored. Dulles assumed that the new young president would be unable to refuse any needed support in the heat of battle if things went wrong. During the night of April 15, 1961, CIA piloted bombers destroyed Cuba's minuscule air force. At midnight, two days later, troops invaded the Bay of Pigs only to run headlong into Castro's tanks. The troops were forced to dig in on the exposed beach and wait for the Navy and Air Force to arrive. It was then that Dulles made the call to Kennedy, insisting that he authorize planes and ships to bail out the stranded troops. Much to his surprise, the president flatly refused, leaving them to defend themselves. Gallant Cuban refugees must have known that they were chancing, determined as they were against heavy odds, to pursue their courageous attempts to regain their island's freedom. But Cuba is not an island unto itself, and our concern is not ended by mere expressions of non-intervention or regret. Although Kennedy accepted full responsibility for the fiasco, he felt betrayed and was determined to destroy the agency to prevent it happening again. Over the next few years, the CIA's intent on removing Castro designed several failed attempts on his life, including contaminating his cigars with LSD, a pill containing botulin toxins designed to make him ill, a seashell that would explode and kill him while he was scuba diving, contamination of his wetsuit with a fungus that would give him a deadly skin rash. In October 1963, Kennedy ordered the agency to cease all assassination attempts. He then made efforts with the help of special advisor to the U.S. delegation at the U.N., William Atwood, to develop closer ties with Cuba. On November the 17th, 1963, Atwood reported that he had been invited to a meeting in Havana. It was the dawn of new U.S.-Cuban relations. However, this progress was stopped short when five days later, President Kennedy was shot in the head in a motorcade through Dallas. The CIA could now, without any revolutionary presidential interruptions, return to creating anti-communist propaganda and sabotage. By 1964, Vietnam had replaced Cuba as the greatest threat to the agency. They were determined to make Vietnam their own personal war. It would be an opportunity to restore some honor to their damaged reputation. It also provided the perfect testbed for weapons that had waited in readiness throughout the Cold War. William Colby led the Phoenix program, the centerpiece of the efforts of the CIA in Vietnam. Colby realized that the Vietnamese war had two fronts the conventional war that was being fought against the North Vietnamese army and the sophisticated guerrilla war that was being carried out by the Viet Cong. Project Phoenix was designed to tackle the Viet Cong problem. Operatives would pay as much as 20,000 US dollars for a crucial name or piece of information. Suspected VC and VC sympathizers were to be assassinated by special hunter killer teams. An estimated 20,000 suspected communist supporters were killed without trial as a result of this program. Among its other covert operations was the use of the supposed to be commercial airline Air America to ferry its own operatives, concealed weapons and drugs into Saigon. Unfortunately, Air America in return was transporting raw opium, which after being refined in Thailand, found its way back to Saigon in the form of heroin that went on sale to the U.S. troops in the jungles and rice fields. William Colby, like those before him, had made the vital mistake of underestimating the abilities of the enemy. The Vietnamese had been for almost a millennium fighting off foreign invaders and had by now perfected guerrilla tactics. In the end, the Americans were forced out of Vietnam. The CIA had, however, emerged victorious. Vietnam was the paving ground for some of its most frightening theories and would set the tone for the company's actions in the years to come. Grenada was invaded by the US military in October 1983. America, in response to the assassination of Maurice Bishop, had acted to restore stability by reinstating democracy. 
Maurice Bishop's PRC party was a pan-socialist one with links to Russia, Cuba and China. His goal was to implement social reform in the island so that the population would enjoy relative equal opportunities and a good standard of living. Rumours have it that the CIA, with the assistance of Bernard Cord, the insurrection leader, had planned the demise of Maurice Bishop and the PRC. CIA did not need another communist-aligned nation so close to its borders, and to prevent this, nothing would stand in their way. Manuel Noriega helped the Mexican Air Force control the movement of cocaine from Colombia and Bolivia through Panama and into the U.S. Noriega's life was threaded through corrupt Panamanian politics since the 1960s. His career of drug trafficking and money laundering profited from the close cooperation with the DEA, who arrested his competitors. Noriega had enjoyed a long stint on the CIA payroll in return for many services, such as helping the covert wars against Salvadoran rebels and his offer of assistance to Oliver North. Noriega's arrogance later became an embarrassment to the Bush administration. Noriega's reign was concluded when George Bush ordered the Operation Just Cause invasion in December 1989, in what was summarized as the most expensive one-man drug bust in history. General Omar Torrios preceded him, a populist whose rule was ended in a suspicious 1981 plane crash that some believe was CIA arranged. The CIA over the years has been suspected of playing a major role in some of the world's most scandalous executions. The CIA walked away with no probable involvement in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in the early 1960s. The former Belgian Congo country had been a vital source of minerals for America and Western Europe. When the Belgians pulled out of their African colony, they left instability and chaos behind. When UN troops failed to contain the army of Lumumba's arch-rival, General Moise Tshumbe, Lumumba turned to the USSR for support. This meant that the Soviets would now be able to extend their bloc into Africa. This, as far as the agency was concerned, was an unforgivable offence. For the outside world, it appeared as though Lumumba was betrayed to the Tshombi forces and murdered while in captivity, when in fact he had been conveniently removed by the CIA to prevent Soviet domination in Africa. The CIA walked away with nothing pointing to their involvement in the death of this revolutionary African leader. I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. And I see America through the eyes of a victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. On February the 21st, 1965, as Malcolm X stood to address a meeting in the Audubon Ballroom in New York City, he was shot in the chest with bullets from a sawn-off shotgun. No evidence directly linked the death of the revolutionary Afro-American Muslim leader to the CIA, but suspicions still persist. The nation of Islam, by that time, was thoroughly infiltrated. They could not plan a stroll in Central Park. So at, at the very least, they were aware of plans to assassinate Brother Malcolm you know, and did nothing to stop it. At worst, they were the puppeteers. Malcolm's open condemnation of the CIA and U.S. involvement in the Congo made him a target. The day before he was scheduled to address a summit conference of African Prime Ministers in Cairo, he collapsed with severe stomach pains after eating a meal at his hotel. He now suspected that the agency was out to get him, but still continued his campaign. As rumors of the agency's intentions spread, Malcolm was refused entry into France. A few days before he was shot, his home in Queens was firebombed, a warning sign of what was to the come. The assassination of Malcolm X was an unfortunate tragedy, and it revealed that there are still uh, numerous uh, people in our nation who have degenerated to the point of expressing dissent through murder, and uh, we haven't learned to disagree without being violently disagreeable. It was assumed that Malcolm's death was the result of sectarian revenge, the view held by many prominent blacks, however, was that Malcolm's killing was a political act with international implications. 
Malcolm's successor, Leon Amir, determined to expose the agency, scheduled a press conference during which he was to present head to head the organ. The next morning, Amir was found dead in Boston's Sherry Biltmore Hotel. The police report stated that he had died of an epileptic fit. Ironically, he had no medical history of epilepsy. Malcolm X had been on the CIA watch list for some time. The timing of the assassination coincided with numerous events, namely his acceptance of Orthodox Islam, and moreover his extension of his initial localized policy to one that would call for global unity of African nations. The journey was to Mecca to make myself an authentic Muslim and to give us direct links, direct contact, direct communication, cooperation with our brothers and sisters all over the earth. So the first step that has been taken, brothers and sisters, since Gavi died, to actually establish contact with our African brothers on the African continent. Malcolm X had grown from a local menace to an international voice for the oppressed black man. His power was on the rise, and in a preemptive action, he was silenced. No Negro leaders have fought for civil rights. They have begged the white man for civil rights. They have begged the white man for freedom. And every any time you beg another man to set you free, you will never be free. Freedom is something that you have to do for yourself. And until the American Negro lets the white man know that we are really, really ready and willing to pay the price that is necessary for freedom, our people will always be walking around here second-class citizens, or what you call 20th century slaves. What price are you talking about, sir? The price of freedom is death. Another two years later, in 1967, Argentinian-born Che Guevara would become one of the agency's major hits. Che with Castro had been a founder of the Cuban Revolution. He had been a thorn in the CIA's side for a long time. After Castro's liberation of Cuba, Che began representing Cuba on many commercial missions. He also was renowned in the West for his opposition to all forms of imperialism and neo-colonialism, and for his attacks on U.S. foreign policy. During the early 1960s, he defined Cuba's policies and his own views in many speeches and writings, notably El Socialismo y el Hombre en Cuba. Che was later involved in the Congo with other Cuban guerrilla fighters, helping to organize the Patrice Lumumba Battalion. At the time, there was no person more feared by the company than Che Guevara. He had the capacity and charisma necessary to direct the struggle against the political repression of the traditional hierarchies of power in the countries of Latin America and Africa. In 1967, the notorious CIA agent, Felix Rodriguez, captured and assassinated Che while he was organizing a guerrilla group in Bolivia. This assassination, however, backfired globally on the agency. Within days of his death, the charismatic leader had become a world icon, a martyr for the revolution. He would become the poster boy for the 1960s. His image appeared on t-shirts and posters from New York to Tokyo. Even today, his image is still popular. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the cost of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. But neither will we shrink from that risk at any time it must be faced. Oliver Stone's controversial 1991 movie, JFK, forced the case to be reopened with some chilling findings. The overwhelming bulk of material published about Kennedy would point to three major suspects, the FBI, CIA, and the Mafia. These organizations were the only ones with enough resources and assets to plan and execute the murder of the US president in broad daylight and carry out a cover-up operation that would involve the murder of over 50 people. On its own, the Mafia simply did not have the contacts, clout, and know-how to pull off such an elaborate stunt. They probably acted as backup and helped with some of the cleanup operations. There is also a shadow of doubt about the FBI's active involvement in the murder of Kennedy. FBI directors already had enough evidence of the president's constant womanizing to bring him down without murdering him. The FBI's lack of motivation can lead us to conclude that they, like the Mafia, only assisted in the cleanup. This leaves only the CIA. They had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. The company could not forget Canada's refusal to support them during the Bay of Pigs fiasco. 
In addition, he was also considering pulling the U.S. out of Vietnam and therefore putting a stop to the company's own little war. He also was a sympathizer to the civil rights struggle. However, what topped it all was the fact that he was determined to destroy the company and put an end to its deceptive tactics. This is the BBC Home Service. It is with deep regret that we announce that President Kennedy is dead. President Kennedy was shot in full view of the public during a routine electioneering motorcade in Dallas, Texas. One hour before the shooting, the entire Washington phone system was taken down. The motorcade route was suspiciously changed at the last minute to accommodate his passage through the open area of Dealey Plaza. The Secret Service conveniently neglected carrying out routine checks on windows overlooking the route. To the horror of those watching, the president was killed by shots to the upper body and then a final conclusive shot to the head. According to eyewitnesses and a home video made by Abraham Zapruder, these shots were not fired by a lone gunman. Afterwards, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested within hours of the shooting. Later, while still in police custody, Jack Ruby, a mob cleanup guy, shot Oswald dead. The initial public reaction was that Ruby was a patriotic American. However, these were the actions of a mob silencer. Although Oswald, a Marxist, appeared to be a supporter for Castro, he also maintained relationships with right-wing extremists and known CIA operatives. It had now become clear to the world that Oswald had taken the fall for the agency. It was General Charles Cabell who changed the motorcade route so that it made the slow, fatal turn past the Texas Book Depository, ultimately luring the president into the deadly crossfire. General Cabell had been assistant director of the CIA until Kennedy fired him after the Bay of Pigs showdown. Even George Bush Sr. was suspected of being involved in the assassination plot, as he was at the time deeply involved in the CIA and in the Bay of Pigs invasion plot. Lee Harvey Oswald had been employed by ex-FBI agent Guy Bannister, who was also supposed to be involved in the recouping of Cuban exiles for covert CIA missions into Cuba. By coincidence, on the day of the assassination, Richard Nixon also happened to be in Dallas, supposedly on business for Pepsi-Cola. Close to 60 people who were either witnesses or connected with some phase of the operation would die under mysterious circumstances in the years and months following the assassination. It was now becoming apparent to the U.S. and the rest of the world that the CIA were capable of anything. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Thank you and good night. Bob Marley, born in 1945 in Kingston, Jamaica, revolutionized the world with his music. More than a music genius, he used his art form as a conduit for social awakening. He wrote uncompromising conscious songs for and about the disenfranchised people of the West Indian slums. He was an icon of honor and hope for those that had none. Bob Marley stood as a conscious figure in Jamaican politics when he united the hands of political rivals Michael Manley and Edward Siaga. However, his popularity with people extended across the seas and he became a spokesman through his lyrics, crying out against oppression, slavery, injustice and war. In 1980, for Zimbabwe's independence, President Mugabe enthusiastically invited Bob Marley to perform at the celebrations. He was greatly admired throughout the world for his message of African unity and civil justice. Songs like Africa Unite, War, So Much Trouble in the World, Jericho Walls, Redemption Song show the direction and power of his lyrics. It was no secret that Bob and his associates, being powerful revolutionaries, were closely monitored by the CIA. When Bob Marley was suddenly diagnosed as having melanoma cancer, a rare cancer for blacks, rumors of CIA involvement surfaced. In May 1981, the legend passed away and the world was in shock.
It was said that when in France for another ailment, he was given an overdose of radiation. Some blamed his cancer on his use of marijuana. However, melanoma cancer is not caused by marijuana usage. In death, his message lives through his music, scribed in the books of immortality. The agency did not always act alone. In the 1960s, the CIA and FBI were forced to work together for the first time. After the assassination of President Kennedy, fingers were being pointed at both agencies. The CIA's connection to Lee Harvey Oswald was being questioned. It was now necessary for both agencies to come together to ensue that the hasty explanation made by the Warren Commission is stuck. By the arrival of the 1960s, the two organizations had achieved a good working relationship. While the FBI spied on radical groups, harassed peace organizations, and executed many of the leaders of the Black Panther Party, the CIA operatives opened mail, tapped phones, penetrated anti-war organizations, and set up campus fronts to pinpoint dangerous student agitators. Even though the FBI and CIA were now working somewhat in tandem, they still stuck to the firm belief that nothing illegal existed in the time of war. I understand that people are suspicious of the CIA. Our activities are secret, and accordingly there is not a lot of public understanding of what we do. In the course of recruiting agents to penetrate drug cartels, to break up those groups to bring drugs to the United States, our case officers, our men and women, it was bad very bad The CIA had initially emerged as a small operation with limited jurisdiction. However, almost immediately, they would be allowed to operate according to their own laws and with very few restrictions. The cutting edge on Irene FM. They were also given the power to undertake covert operations. The question now emerges of who really was in charge. By 1953, when Alan Dulles became director, the agency had already become its own governor. His brother ran the State Department. They had in fact become what was described as a de facto shadow government. They provided information about their actions only when they thought it was necessary. Directive NSC-4 empowered the agency to allow them greater elbow room in the international arena in the fight against communism. The truth was out there, but could not be entrusted to the American public or even the American president. All of their actions were therefore untouched by external influence and strictly controlled internally. Using money, propaganda and influence, the agency played a vital role in determining the outcome of elections in many of the European countries that were emerging from the devastation of World War II. They ensured the defeat of the communists in the 1948 Italian elections and the major victory of the Labour Party in Israel. Throughout its existence, the agency had survived ten presidents. Truman became wary of them. Eisenhower went along with whatever they did. Kennedy was determined to tear them down brick by brick, while Lyndon, like Eisenhower, gave all their operations a rubber stamp. Richard Nixon used the agency for his own dirty tricks operations. After Nixon's resignation, the CIA would be in as much disarray as the country. President Jimmy Carter was to make the first move to ensure that the rules of the US were respected. In 1977, he appointed Admiral Stansfield Turner as director of the agency. They both wanted operatives to concentrate on high-tech information gathering and phase out all of their not-too-admirable operations. Unfortunately, when Ronald Reagan came into power, Turner would be replaced by William Casey, a veteran of the OSS. The agency could now return to dirty tricks, destabilization and quasi-military covert ops. George Bush was the head of the CIA, and when he came to power, he was beyond the shadow of a doubt the CIA's man at the top. As a CIA top man, and as a president, he was rumored to be involved in some unspeakable covert operations, from involvement in the Kennedy assassination to Irangate. The link between the current president, George W. Bush, needs close attention. After all, he is his father's son. <laughs> Throughout 
throughout the CIA's brief history, we have seen the revelation behind many of their actions. Consequently, any statement made by the agency is routinely being questioned. This lends a certain measure of unwarranted credence to some of the most paranoid and far-fetched stories about its operations and objectives. For more than 50 years, the CIA was willing to remove any source they perceived as a threat to their survival. They effectively exhausted the excuse that communism was an overwhelming danger and that no action could be considered extreme in their fight to put an end to it. As far as they were concerned, the means always justified the end. With the Red Menace now only confined to Cuba, the company can no longer excuse its methodology for conducting business. Will it be possible to ever fully dismantle the CIA? According to the Hydra of Greek myth, you can cut the head off and ten more will grow back in its place. The only way really to effectively close down the agency would be to revoke its character and cut off its money. But again, is this possible? For years the agency has received defense budgets, all without the authorization of Congress. The agency also received an income from various ongoing investment enterprises that range from drug trafficking to the ownership of airlines and banks. The agency's ties to some of the world's most powerful organizations guarantees them a strong support system. The CIA could in fact stand alone as a vast autonomous entity operating either for hire or as it did before, according to its own agenda. In the new century, the CIA is a forgotten menace. The new government, they say, has little need for their dirty tricks. There is no more communist threat. There is no enemy physically suitable for the CIA to attack. The power that they once exercised has very little sympathy in this new bold era. All the old enemies have faded from the battlefield and the CIA, like an old weapon, is rusting away. Or is it? The events of the 11th of September will mark the return of the Jackal and issue a brand new lease of life to the old company. There's 200,000 Afghans have fled their homes during U.S. military strikes. To find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will show the world that we And they will follow that path all the way to where it ends. In history's unmarked grave of discarded lies. September the 11th, 2001. The symbol of America's wealth, power and glory crumbles to the ground. America's indestructibility seems broken. A frustrated nation now looks for a physical target on which to exercise its vengeance. A human emotional reaction to a crisis. A message is needed. A military message to alleviate anger. And a political message to show the world America's resolve. Congress gave him uh, even more power than really almost any other declaration of war that I've ever seen. However, in this new world of warfare, the enemy is vague. Vague enemies make for poor missile targets. How can America retaliate against this kind of enemy that lies dormant within their midst? And how can a sword be used on an operation that requires a scalpel? The world lays in fear at a new word which comes to dominate daily conversation. Terror. And the emblem of this terror is Osama bin Laden and the country that houses him, Afghanistan. Without hesitation, Bin Laden's guilty verdict precedes his trial as America marches its battle fleet to the distant seas. But this is a war that America will not handle alone. If blood is to be spilled in Afghanistan, it will be blood not only on America's hands. Wars always know sequels, and history is our greatest teacher. How do they start and how they end is no mystery, but always truth and the innocent are its biggest casualties. The world has always been made of a minority of poisonous personalities who are not exclusive to land, race or religion. But every decade needs its heroes and villains. A black and white concept which justifies convenient wars. 
The unblurring line was drawn by President Bush, and under his vague rhetoric, he rallies a hypnotized world to strike collectively and indiscriminately at a naked evil. He has manipulated the world to join him on a roller coaster ride, while his loyal sidekick, Tony Blair, blindly jumps on for the ride without even asking the destination. In America's arrogance, it would not even lend a second to examine a much criticized foreign policy. Policies clearly at the root of the hostilities that beseeched the city of New York. Power words and rhetoric dot the screen in an action drama more befitting the movie cinema. Politicians jockey for their spotlight, seeking new catchphrases, which the media pump to the masses. The enemy is over there, and when they are defeated, there will be peace on earth. Sincerity has been traded for flaunting of meaningless gestures, which will have no effect on the game except to rearrange the pieces and inflame the problem they claim they have come to extinguish. The war on terror is a war that has few clear enemies and less clear aims. The first objective of a long campaign, and the first objective is to bring, uh, is to bring people to justice uh, who we feel like uh, committed uh, this particular uh, set of atrocities. The Western political and media machines have placed halos over their leaders' heads and horns on the heads of their enemies. In the Western aim to combat this evil, they themselves have politically terrorized weaker nations to bow to their wishes. The free world is not giving them much freedom in its attempts to form a global coalition against terrorism. From promises to bribes to downright bullying, this coalition will be formed by any means necessary. Those who dare oppose or question stand to receive Afghanistan's faith. Stirring dark waters, America and her Western allies are causing a tide of conflict around the world in a completely irresponsible and callous way. The side effects of this war on terrorism are bringing countries such as Pakistan and Indonesia closer to civil war as people tally between loyalty to their brothers and self-preservation. Pakistan's President Musharraf has traded his Muslim brothers for Western promises. The hand he is extending to the West will soon turn into a leg. He has failed to realize that when it comes to promises, America has a history of treachery. From the promises General Custer made the Native American Indians, to the promises made to the South Vietnamese, and more recently the promises made by former President Bush to the Iraqi people in return for their opposition to Saddam. After America gets what they want, all promises to the non-Western world will be off. America is powerful and has always stirred political opinion in a direction which is favorable to American dominance. The West has set a very broad net to catch one small fish. America has a blank check and wants all the nations of the world to sign it. With this blank check, America can act in any direction she deems suitable and necessary. Using his Texan cowboy words like dead or alive, Bush is appealing to a rogue mass and for a so-called leader of a civilized country, he sets no moral precedent, shows no restraint, and turns away from intellectual console to resolve the problem. History has a knack for remembering presidents who are associated with wars, and it seems that every American president seeks a war to be remembered by. And George W. Bush is making sure he goes down in history as an American hero, a man who restored patriotism and exports the American dream. But the ink has not yet dried, as we fearfully wait to see what will be left for history to write. With every atrocity, they hope that America grows fearful. Congress gave him retreating from the world. even more power than really and almost any other friends. declaration of war that I've ever seen. They stand against us because we stand in their way. We're not deceived by their pretenses to piety. We have seen their kind before. They're the heirs of all the murderous ideologies of the 20th century. By sacrificing human life to serve their radical visions, by abandoning every value except the will to power, they follow in the path of fascism, Nazism, and totalitarianism. This is a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. It is a deliberate effort of a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people. December 1979. 
Russia, ignoring international condemnation, waged war on the Asian country of Afghanistan. The Russians were met by a surprisingly determined quarter of a million strong unified Muslim army bent on purging this communist terror from their land. The tenacious Mujahideen, armed with Russian-made Kalashnikovs, became the freedom warriors glamorized by films such as Rambo III. Their steadfast faith was their only asset. When Ronald Reagan succeeded Carter as president, he blessed the Mujahideen, calling them freedom fighters, and covertly backed this insurgents with billions of dollars of state-of-the-art military equipment. In their eyes, this was Russia's Vietnam. And like America almost a decade earlier, Eurasian would eventually erode Russian morale. The CIA came into the picture and was responsible for training these Muslim warriors in the art of sabotage and other covert tactics. The international Western media sanctioned this war and reiterated its holy objectives. The Muslims opposed communism on religious grounds and the West on political grounds. In theory, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Osama bin Laden came to Afghanistan. I tell you, this tape is rough. We don't finish it all. You think it finished, it don't finish. You just got halfway. So, stay tuned. Some very revealing reasoning going on here. Very revealing. This is the Cutting Edge on IRFM. <laughs> In the background, you're listening to Aineka music. Brand new music. Soviet Union, America rejoiced as years of anti-communist rhetoric and Cold War tactics had triumphed. In America's eyes, democracy had prevailed as light outshines darkness. America, having what she really wanted, turned away from Afghanistan and all the promises she had made. Afghanistan was left in ruins. Two-thirds of the population became refugees. For Afghanistan, the success bred of devotion had paid off. 
and now the Warriors sought to continue their success by fighting against oppression on a global scale. In Bosnia, Chechnya, Kashmir, Sudan, and Somalia, they had become the police of the Islamic world. However, a bitter soreness born from betrayal was brewing for America, their former ally. In 1991, a new war was waged against Saddam Hussein for his invasion of oil rich Kuwait, a country with enormous American investment. Prior to this, America, via its dubious tentacles, namely the CIA, had aided Saddam's rise to power during the Iran-Iraq war. Saudi Arabia, bordering Kuwait, felt threatened by Saddam's army and turned to the USA, a non-Muslim power for defense. In the eyes of the Muslim world, the leaders of Saudi Arabia had turned to a non-Islamic force for the defense of the cradle of Islam. A strange and unacceptable dilemma. To add insult to injury, after the war against Saddam was won, America decided to set up a permanent base in Saudi Arabia. In the eyes of Osama bin Laden and the majority of the conscious Muslim world, this act defaced Islam's sacred sites. For his blatant outspokenness against the restricted Saudi monarchy, bin Laden was stripped of his citizenship and publicly disowned by his family. Enraged and infuriated, bin Laden declared unlimited war on all Americans, soldiers and civilians. An act outside of the fold of Islam. A few months ago and again this week, bin Laden publicly vowed to wage a terrorist war against America, saying, and I quote, we do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. They're all targets. Their mission is murder, and their history is blood. In 1992, bin Laden found a new home in Sudan, a nation of Islamic people being ruled by an Islamic system of government. Bin Laden contributed significantly to this poor African country by building roads and hospitals. According to the CIA, bin Laden used Sudan as a cover for international terrorist training camps. In December 1992, American troops once again found themselves in another Muslim country, Somalia, with allegedly noble intentions. Once again, this was viewed by the Muslim world as an extension of American control, a base to monitor and suppress any Islamic uprising. When the World Trade Center was bombed in 1993, Sudan was caught in America's political backlash as heavy sanctions were waged upon them and they were branded with the dubious title a state that sponsors terrorism. In 1995, Sudan felt America's military fury when a pharmaceutical store was targeted and innocent people were killed. American intelligence reported that this store was a haven for terrorist activity. Sudan renounced these claims and opened the investigation which were later internationally confirmed. The findings showed that the store was just that, a store, and nothing more. Not only did this show the unreliability of American intelligence information, but also its clear neglect for Muslim lives. In 1998, terror struck a double blow in Kenya and Tanzania, almost simultaneously. American embassies were targeted by a truck bomb. What shocked the world was the majority of casualties for poor African Muslims. The terrorists were prepared to kill their own to further their cause. Those who perpetrated these horrendous acts have lost their humanity and have become like wild beasts with only one fault in mind, to devour their prey. These persons, so depraved, only want to bring death and destruction because of their hatred for the United States of America. Whenever any human being is deprived of justice, the mind becomes imbalanced. The greater the injustice, the greater the imbalance. In a balanced world, institutions are established for the redress of grievances, and with this facility of expression, rage and frustration can be quenched and abated. The terrorists did not target the beautiful island of Barbados or Switzerland. These are not random, meaningless acts. So why? Why is America so hated? America was getting for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. Unfortunately, this self-indulgent nursery rhyme answer alone strips him of credibility as a leader in tune with the reality of the world outside of America.
After the Gulf War, over 500,000 children died because of U.S. sanctions. Innocent children, hidden from the eyes of the media and the tears of the outside world. Palestinians die daily with what they see as an oppressive and heavy-handed Israeli government, supported politically and financially by America. You have been Laden. We have Sharon, they say. In this world, there is no shortage of hostility for America because of their actions, past and present. Any clear definition of what constitutes terrorism is being avoided, as America is afraid it may first have to turn its anti-terrorism guns on itself. Holman McCarthy is the director of the Center for Teaching Peace. He's a professor at Georgetown Law School and teaches at American University. We have a history of bombing our country in the past 20 years alone. We bombed Libya, Grenada, Panama, Somalia, Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, and uh, before that, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Congo, uh, Indonesia, Guatemala. We are, as Martin Luther King said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is my own government. Until we disarm and de-escalate our war machine, we're going to be hated around the world. Clearly, by any dictionary definition, America is an international terrorist, exporting intimidation and intrigue. It is interesting to note that the USA controls over 70% of the international market in weapons. The US peddles products of destruction to so-called undemocratic regimes, and unstable regions across the planet. Of the 48 regional wars going on today, 39 involved US weapons. And since World War II, over 40 million people have died in these conflicts, largely women and children. In a recent CNN poll, would you accept more government involvement in your life if it meant greater security? 70% voted yes. Now the coalition governments have people so scared that they are willing to give up their personal freedom in exchange for totalitarianism. The CIA has failed the people it has sworn to represent. The CIA gladly takes the bullet for not being more prepared. They say with more funding diverted from schools and health, they will be better equipped to protect the nation. Now that the government recognizes the need for greater intelligence, the CIA will no doubt be dusted off and restored to its former seat of power, a seat that it has not sat on since the Cold War era. The CIA and NSA have depended on Project Echelon, a multinational electronic snooping system with keyword retrieval. Think of Echelon as a very internet search engine. And if you're smart, you don't use the word like bomb and trade center and hijack and white left. You don't use keywords that are going to piss people off. While they're up over there, you're just Sucking up like a vacuum cleaner, every single transmission, cell phones, faxes, radios, telephone calls, HF, VHF, so on. And what happens is all that data is collected, and then it's run through computers, and then it has to get sifted down to where we have people who are The Taliban regime before this incident received mixed feelings. Regardless of what is believed of the Taliban, they are clearly not the terrorists that inspired the World Trade Center bombing. They have been drawn into this conflict on a different road because of their friendship and loyalty to an ex-soldier of the Afghan-Russian war. They have been singled out because they have no fear in a climate of fire. They have made honor their bond and have not knelt before an insurmountable opposition. They have no fear or respect for America and thus pose a threat, a threat that must be killed before it is allowed to blow. The Taliban, prior to September 11th, have practiced an isolationist policy which has not been to neither them or their people's advantage. Politics is something alien to the Taliban rulers. Their no-tolerance policy and hardline tactics have choked practicality. Nonetheless, it is noticeable that in all of the smoke, they have stood cool-headed and asked one simple request, give us evidence. And tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to the United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. The world that claims to be defending civilization seems to be the one that should take lessons from these so-called uncivilized militants. Bush claims no negotiation. 
What? These demands are not open to negotiation. This stance adds credence to the accusations of the Taliban that his war has nothing to do with bin Laden, but is really a war to crush an Islamic government. Mr. The Taliban have earned the respect of many young revolutionary thinkers throughout the world who see through the Western propaganda mark. Many who previously condemned their extreme Islamic ideology now have great reverence for their bold stance. The Taliban know that the only way Bush can win this war is if they surrender bin Laden and bow. In a climate of fire, they know they must stand firm. set up the basic validation to take away freedom, the same freedom they profess to uphold. Layer by layer, they will peel away until the world is their extension. Now it is impossible to separate any non-American ideology from terrorist ideology. Any group calling for an Islamic government is seen as a terrorist group. This word is being bastardized, and it will be used to drive fear into a jittery Western people. All that stands outside of democracy and Western values will be painted with this brush. Their leaders are self-appointed. They want to overthrow existing governments in many Muslim countries, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. They want to drive Israel out of the Middle East. So, is it really about terrorism, or is the agenda wider? Although Blair and Bush have reassured the world that it is not a war against the Muslim people, and that terrorism and Islam are not the same, it is strange that all the countries being targeted are Muslim countries, with absolutely no exception. Uh, our most dominant nation we've found in the last 20 years are mostly people with power. Interesting fact. That's the U.S. foreign policy. Go bomb, go bomb and kill people with dark colors. Little mention of plans to attack Ireland has been proposed. No plans to bomb Irish camps harboring and training Sinn Féin terrorists. Jerry Adams' fate is not on any dead or alive poster. It is also interesting to note that when Sinn Féin terrorist acts occur, the media label them as just Sinn Féin terrorist acts, never as extremist Catholic Christian fanatics. Nor was Professor Christian Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, paraded as a Christian extremist. Well, it depends what you mean by that. If you speak, mean, you mean any resistance by the, the terrorists, is that the European don't like you. They're causing a resistance like that. They like him. They're causing even the revolution is to get lost. But if they don't like him, they get lost in the seven. One of the deeper agendas for the West is one of contagion. Since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim world has been fragmented into bickering groups. The only thing that can unite the world's largest practicing religion is an Islamic government. The Islamic government sentiment in the South Asian region since the emergence of the Taliban has been on the increase. British Pakistani Muslims recently called for Pakistan to adopt a similar pan-Islamic government. Afghanistan has started a tradition that has to be nipped in the bud. In no way, shape or form can the Islamic sentiment be allowed to spread to Pakistan. It is interesting to note that Pakistan, unlike any other Muslim majority nation, is the only one to have nuclear capabilities. So it seems the bigger agenda is, as the Taliban say, beyond Bin Laden, with the key objectives being, one, to form a US-friendly and dependent government in Afghanistan, two, to further control resources of the Gulf and Caspian Sea, three, to monitor Pakistan's nuclear bases and calm Israeli fears, 
and to kill the seeds of Islamic rule before they are allowed to grow. We need to question the motives behind some of the countries of the world lending their support to America. Russia, a country once embarrassingly defeated by the Mujahideen. Afghanistan's Northern Alliance, a rogue group of rapists and pirates backed into a 5% pocket of the region, desperately looking for any advantage to defeat the Taliban. China has now jumped on the American bandwagon by equating terrorism to the Islamic separatist movement in the Yingzha province a people simply seeking a separate autonomy from mainland Chinese rule. Some of the bandits that make up the coalition defy ethical consideration. The American government, like the CIA, has transcended beyond morals and ethics that achieved the desired end. America has signed a forced Jim Pact, whose consequences will become apparent in the years to come. When this witch hunt ends, America and her allies will have all of its enemies dispatched and neutralized. And so, with one word, terrorism, the 21st century witch hunt has begun. Peace advocates are applauding the president's speech, but only with one hand. Along with Attorney General John Ashcroft's call for roving wiretaps, means that many American citizens could soon be more listened to than Osama bin Laden. Prior to September the 11th, the media via the Hollywood Institute had begun a mental marination process with films such as The Siege and the more dangerous film, Rules of Engagement. The aim of the media is to marry Islam to terrorism in a slow ceremony. Misuse of words like Islamicist and Muslim fundamentalist, which are generally benign in nature, are being reverted, hijacked, and associated with the extreme action of a negligible view. The media generally parades two types of Muslims on their screens. The extreme impractical groups with un-Islamic agendas, fueled and engulfed by hate and frustration. And the second group of old, weak, pacified, disillusioned, out-of-touch reactionary and apologetics. That they are a sharp misrepresentation of the contemporary intellectual Muslim world. These assimilated and confused people, as opposed to stand up for justice, strip themselves of their honor and beg like dogs for crimes they have not committed. In a malicious attempt to demonize Muslims, footage of Palestinians celebrating in the aftermath of the attack were pumped around the world. This Remember how we used to night up and down? Somebody tell me what I found, hey. Oh, no, 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 tell, 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 so ever get saved. It's not right. Footage of Palestinians celebrating in the aftermath of the attack were pumped around the world. This now became the focal point that enraged the world against the Muslim community. The media has used its powerful arm again to control and reroute sympathy. Whatever little sympathy the Palestinian people were receiving from their resistance to the Israeli occupation was now quickly withdrawn. Clearly these repeating images were circulated with that predominant objective in mind. Rumors emerged later that the footage, several years old, and the celebrations were with regards to Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait. A more accurate report investigated and found that people celebrating had no knowledge that America had been attacked. This information was conveniently ignored by the major media companies. Once again, the Muslim world was faced with defending itself against crimes it had not committed. In the minds of the unvoiced and oppressed, the tragedy that befell America is a tragedy that has become normal to them. In their minds, America knows how they feel, now that she too has tasted death. The error of some elements in the Muslim world is in their laid-back approach prior to these chain of events. Two groups exist, those who have become content to remove their identity and merge into the society, a group that now lies exposed and homeless, desperately turning back to their Islamic identity for shelter. 
And the second group, the isolationist, who has left the niche of educating the non-Muslim world to the non-Muslim world. This selfish exclusion has now brought great misunderstanding, and from misunderstanding, the Muslims living in the West have now found themselves surrounded by people who fear them. The previous narrow generalizations of stereotyping and alienating the West have been to no benefit. What many have failed to recognize is that America is a massive nation made up of many ethnic minorities and cultures. It is a nation with a broad range of views and has brought forth some of the most revolutionary thinkers such as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Within this wide variety of people, there are hearts and minds begging to learn about Islam but they are left wanting. The media has been pumping out anti-Islamic material for decades, and now that things have come to a head, the newly stimulated Muslim groups have risen from their slumber to fight a media battle that is in its maturity. When Hitler came to power, he slowly called for one item after another until finally his true agenda was revealed. He did not on one sunny day come straight out and profess that all Jews were the enemies of Germany. This sympathy was built up in stages until a frenzy of emotion was created so unbridled that whatever Hitler declared was acceptable. No one dared challenge him. No one dared question if it was right or wrong. For those who forget history, they are doomed to repeat it. The past, future and present are invariably linked in a cyclic dance. Nations do not come to power by acts of generosity, nor do they stay there with compassion and sincerity. The jewel of freedom is protected by an army of thieves. Let us not be fooled by the charity arm that they have extended to the Afghan people. Charity has a double edge. It maintains a good public image and it acts to control people. Starving people make poor soldiers, and they will never bite the hand that feeds them. Freedom for the West means the descent of the Third World. The lifestyles enjoyed in the West are all possible because of a complete world system that keeps certain nations and their people in check. Slavery and such systems enforced by the West on the so-called Third World built up their empires and feed a society bent on maintaining a standard of living by continuous taxation and exploitation. These are the unconfessed secrets of the superpowers of the world. It is a savage, parasitic reality. The US tragedy brought home a concept alien to the American people. The reality of the suffering of the rest of the world for a long time has been far removed from American lives. This pain has ultimately overflown and tragedy has shown itself to be an indiscriminate beast. A war has begun, and already the first victims are truth and innocence. Their arrogance is the seed of destruction. All they claim they have come to defend is what they will strip from the world. Security and sanctity will be violated as the enemies of the Western dominance become ever more incognito. All of our tears fall to a thirsty earth that has seen centuries of oppression of man by the hand of man. We turn to the one true God and pray that he makes their evil intentions like dust in the wind. This is the president. I like the president before him and the one before him who believes in killing people to solve our international disputes. The European definition now isn't necessarily the definition. In a world of an eye for an eye, uh, the whole world is the block. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these no, acts and those who held them. The enemy of freedom.
Jim has chosen to make this year. It is a big idea. A new world order. I see America through the eyes of a victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. Without crime. Why? You can get all the film and the footage of all the carnage in Los Angeles, but you can show me no footage of any damage in, in Iraq. And all you show me is some surgical fight. Now, when you later, it comes out that these fools are surgical fights. John, as Martin Luther King said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is my own government. Until we disarm and de-escalate our war machine, we're going to be hated around the world. There lies an organization which acts above the law. An organization that acts without conscience, without morals, without regrets. A group who follow only a dark and untouchable ideology. Black helicopters and black ops are real. An organization above the law without a god and without a conscience do exist. There is no price too high and no casualties too great. A cold, rogue organization that has risen up independent of the people, independent of government. December 7th. 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. It was not until 1941, when motivated by Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor, that the USA decided that it was time they became part of what was known as the Great Game. When the US entered World War II, they were lacking in vital spy and counter-spy skills. The Russians, British, and Germans had been mastering these skills for centuries. The USA was at an obvious disadvantage. The wheels were set in motion, and in 1942, the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, was created. General William Donovan, a World War I hero, was selected to head the organization. His determined, jovial personality and his upper-class status set the tone and played a significant role in shaping the actions and attitudes, actions that would later be inherited by the OSS successor. The OSS not only carried out the daily operations of intelligence gathering, but in addition, it was engaged as a concealed weapon for the various resistance and partisan organizations fighting in occupied countries in both Europe and the Far East. The hierarchy of the organization were students of Harvard, Yale, and other Ivy League colleges, sons of the upper class, who could combine exquisite taste, impeccable manners, and brutal ruthlessness. The OSS had developed several assassination attempts against Adolf Hitler. They almost succeeded in their attempts when a bomb plot in 1944 came close to blowing him up at his wolf's lair. As Germany collapsed, a race against the Russians for Nazi technology and intelligence begun. The OSS, under the codename Operation Paperclip, obtained a number of files and records detailing experiments involving mind control and psychoactive drugs that were conducted on the concentration camp inmates. They also obtained key surviving Nazi personnel such as Joseph Mengel, the doctor in charge of human experiments. Mengel and other war criminals were quietly relocated to Canada. General Reinhard Gellin was the head of Hitler's intelligence. When Germany's defeat was imminent, Gellin predicted that the future conflict would be waged between the two emerging superpowers, America and the Soviet Union. Gellin, as part of a deal with the American military, agreed to surrender important documents pertaining to the Soviet Union. In addition, as part of that deal, he asked that his organization, the Gellin Organization, be absorbed into U.S. military intelligence. In 1947, the U.S. Congress passed an act that absorbed the OSS into a new organization called
called the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, was born. The newly found agency had the responsibility of coordinating, evaluating, and disseminating information from other U.S. intelligent organizations. However, written in the fine print of this act was the additional duty of fighting the dark and eminent Cold War against communism. In 1953, the CIA began its full-out war against communism. The red threat was equated to Satanism. This threat was declared the enemy of the free world. Such a danger was to be unrelentlessly fought tooth and nail. Every tool in their arsenal was to be used to crush any communist rhetoric. If our most privileged information about the world has been coming to us, to our policymakers, yes. since 1940... This is the cutting edge and IRFM coming true. We have been listening to a tip about the CIA involvement in people business plus America involvement with Muslim nations, Muslim countries. Okay, come back to your soul.